Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Bob Brocker, founder and president of AidsWise Colorado. So today we're focusing on uh, to learn how you and your indoor family member may benefit by from virtual and remote caregiving and prevention in your own home by participating in a research project from your own home. And uh, we show here the Noble Institute for Healthy Aging and the Colorado Older Adults Financial Justice Coalition, which is a part of the Noble Institute as well. Our guest today is Pat Kelly. He's gonna be talking about a research project at the University of Denver's Noble Institute for Healthy Aging. Yeah, thank you, Bob. And thank you for the opportunity to share the research that we're uh, collaborating with uh, Denver University, the Noble uh, Institute for Healthy Aging. Uh, we'll get into the details about what that research uh, entails, but in general, uh, we at Routinify have been sponsoring research in a number of institutions. This is our third project uh, with the Noble uh, Institute. We've also participated in research activity with uh, CU Anschutz, and outside of the U.S., uh, we've done multiple uh, research projects uh, with the government of uh, Canada. So with that as a backdrop, if any individual participating in uh, today's webinar or listening to the recording of the webinar is interested in learning more about how you or a loved one could participate in the Noble Institute um, research project uh, that's posted uh, here in the, uh, in the chat, uh, you just send an email to financialsecurity at du.edu or feel free to give them a call at 303 Eight seven one six three eight nine. So let's talk a little bit about uh, vir virtual care and its role in individuals helping themselves to age successfully in place, and for people to help uh, the loved ones, whether it's a spouse that they're caring for, uh, a friend, a family member, mother, father, uh, how virtual care can play a role in helping people to um, age in place uh, successfully. So Routinify's application runs on one or more tablet devices. It also can run on a smartphone, but we find that tablet devices are a better form factor. They're bigger. Uh, you can have much more interactive real estate, uh, and they can uh, most importantly be there all the time, as opposed to being on a smartphone. Sometimes your smartphone goes missing. It's too small of a form factor. Uh, you may not keep it charged. So we make sure that these uh, devices are there all day, every day, uh, they can be used as a safety device as well. I'll get into more of that. But it's essentially, it's, a, it's, it's your own personal point of care uh, appliance device. Maybe we'll talk a little bit about all the different tele things uh, when it comes to medicine and health. So telemedicine typically is very clinically focused. It's, as the name indicates, it's very uh, medically uh, focused. Uh, but more important, it's kind of just very episodic. You may have a telemedicine interaction once a year, you know, maybe twice a year. Occasionally, it might be more frequently. But the point is, it's very episodic. It's very much akin to uh, a visit to your doctor's office, which you're not necessarily going uh, there on a daily or weekly basis. People have begun to expand that notion out into the kind of the broader telehealth. Um, again, the telehealth applications have a tendency to be very kind of clinically and medically uh, focused, and they too are episodic. They may be involved uh, multiple days in a row, like in a post-hospital discharge uh, environment, but they're not really meant to be there with you all the time um, as you age. And so Routinify saw an opportunity to uh, deploy what we call continuous wellness monitoring, meaning it's there all day, every day. It's, all, it's there all the time, whether you do or don't have a, a medical uh, challenge uh, in the moment or to help you with the daily management of chronic conditions or other medical challenges. But it's also how we live uh, that has a huge uh, impact on how well we uh, live. Uh, we're interested in health span uh, as much as we are in lifespan. And by health span, I mean how well you're living, um, putting life into those uh, years as opposed to necessarily more years on the clock. More years on the clock is certainly important, but the quality of life that one gets to uh, live is important. And in contrast to the telemedicine and telehealth applications, which are really kind of provider driven, it comes to you from Kaiser or you know a single provider, it takes a village. So we wanna make sure that everybody who can help you with, with your own care, or you just want to interact with, or maybe you want to help them with their care, 
or you mutually want to interact with one another to assist in care, that they all can be part of, of the platform. It's not just one company. It's not a single owner. You're the owner. It's for your for your health and well-being, and you decide who's part of your uh, care community or what we call our care circle. Our care circle. So one of the general, there's lots of, you know, quote, tech uh, in the aging uh, community and the, and the health community. Um, and that's part of the problem. There's just so many of them, you know, and who's going to log in to dozens of different applications, figure out how they work. They don't interoperate. They're not aware of each other. They don't necessarily share data. Um, so uh, although we routinify do aggregate many of these applications, uh, we have made an attempt to have a single application that's really looking at all the things that are important in, in your life. So um, the Routinify device acts as a hub. You know, what it is hubbing is a function of what you need at a moment in time. Uh, we uh, connect to the internet of medical devices. By that, I mean blood pressure cuffs, uh, glucometers. Uh, we're very... Um, up on wearable devices, wearable devices continue to increase in both their capability and uh, capacity, whether it's measuring you know, heart rate, physical activity. Uh, we use them very successful uh, for uh, sleep um, activity, physical activity. Uh, we also use them as a delivery point uh, for nudges. And we'll get into more about how to help somebody establish uh, good routines or habits for aging well. Uh, we're constantly monitoring somebody's, um, in a non-invasive way, their their physical activity or or lack thereof. So as I, I mentioned before, your sleep activity, your physical activity throughout the day. Uh, we use that information to help remind you about uh, what activities to participate in. If you're engaged in remote therapy, other similar types of applications, we help record that so that uh, you can kind of reflect back on how, how you did, and you can share that information with others who may be providing you uh, guidance in that area. It is a point of care device, and by that I mean it's, a, it's where others can come and meet you, whether they are medical professionals or others. So we are very often used in, in a telecare ca uh, capacity. We're very much used in a non-invasive monitoring capacity, and the monitoring is not necessarily just digital monitoring, uh, but we're interacting with you. We're having a, a, a conversation, a digital conversation. And a lot of times the nature of that conversation, the timeliness of that conversation can be very uh, helpful in understanding uh, how you are doing. We can uh, be asking certain questions based on uh, how the day has uh, progressed. Uh, behavior modification, not in a, in a bad way. We're not trying to change who you are. We're just trying to help you be the best you that you can be at any point in time. And so we are all about helping establish uh, routines or pattern for behavior, whether that's uh, adhering to a medicine regime that you may have, helping you uh, monitor certain vitals, uh, nutrition, hydration, certainly here in the Rocky Mountain area is a big deal. A lot of uh, interesting challenges uh, can occur for people forgetting simple things like uh, just having enough to drink throughout the day. And as opposed to just being something that's going to squawk at you and, 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 and you know, quote, nag you or remind you to do something, uh, it's also there, uh, you know, for your, for your edification, for your amusement and entertainment. So you don't need to new Spotify. You don't have to be a YouTube a wizard or others. So we load the system up with your favorite music, your favorite news. It's a platform for sharing photos without not necessarily having to understand how to access iPhoto or Google Photos or others. Of course, you can use those systems through our platform as well, uh, but we make things uh, very simple and very focused on what it is you want to do. It does take a village, and I talked about the village of people that become part of your care circle, but it does take a village of other applications. So we host uh, applications for mental actuation, for physical therapy, for physical um, activity, uh, straight up entertainment types of uh, elements. And there's lots of voice forward types of applications, whether that's uh, Alexa or, or Google Assist. Uh, but when they're running on our pro uh, platform, they're running in a very highly managed, very secure, very HIPAA compliant environment. So we're always looking out for you, making sure that there's nothing on the platform uh, that can uh, have untoward uh, objectives. So that's kind of the general uh, overview of what the platform's about. Let's talk a little bit about how it can be applied 
uh, in your specific situation and how it would be applied in the research environments. Uh, lot, lots of gadgets, depending what you want, the medical devices that I already talked about. But in the home, a lot of times we will be your home automation element. Uh, we don't want to be home automation for automation's sake. We want to automate those things that are accretive to your health. So lots of times having our platform control uh, power outlets, particularly if those power outlets are con connected to you know, critical components, a CPAP machine or others, just to make sure that it's on and operative and that you haven't forgot to turn it on. In some cases, uh, contact closures, whether we're monitoring the opening and closing of a different, given uh, access or egress door or a cabinet door or a drawer, uh, those, those uh, brought in as well. well. Uh, motion detectors uh, can uh, be of a high degree of value. Uh, again, we're not trying to put, you know, granny cams in place. We don't want to be invasive. Sometimes cameras do have a, a good uh, role to play, particularly if they're monitoring an area from a security standpoint. Uh, we incorporate smoke sensors and things of that nature. Again, this is all about ensuring somebody's wellness and safety. And so whatever elements are required for to reach um, to pursue either of those goals can be brought into the platform. Not all of these have to be at play. We do have many uh, clients that are doing um, all of the above because they're dealing with multiple chronic uh, uh, conditions and there may be uh, extenuating uh, safety uh, concerns within their area, or they want to make sure that other people are helping, you know, another set of eyes, another set of ears, helping them manage their own environment. So it takes a plan. Uh, so the, the tech is interesting, but the tech is really there to achieve a plan. So, uh, you know, we and or our partners interact with you and the individual that uh, yourself or the individual that you're uh, helping to care for to figure out, you know, what what is the plan? What are the challenges here? Are they medicine regimes, vital monitoring, physical activity? Are we having uh, challenges with sleep, uh, timing of uh, in events. So we put together a macro care plan about, you know, what we want to help you with all day, every day. We then put that plan into our routine engine. And then that routine engine interprets data that it sees from the outside world, which can be any of those digital devices I talked about before. But it can also be your interaction or your responses to questions that we have, or your patterns of behavior throughout the day, uh, that are used to interpret uh, the plan and take action as necessary. This is just an example of, of a care plan. Now, for the, those of you attending that come from a medical background, you think of a care plan very specific in terms of the context of, say, hypertension or managing diabetes. And those in our vernacular are micro care plans that are embedded in our macro care plan. Our care plans are really talking about everything that should happen all day and all night. And clearly within those, there are embedded medical care plans that might be dealing with specific medical conditions that we're there to assist with as well. But there's other things like um, just general nutrition and uh, exercise and hydration, notes of encouragement, or automatically making connections throughout the day to friends and family to help um, exemplify a socialization and other activities. Or we might be detecting a loneliness scenarios, or we might detect something that we're a little bit concerned of, and we want to reach out to somebody in your care circle, as opposed to waiting for you to realize that there might be a challenge and involve them. Uh, as necessary. Lots of, uh, you can start and build your own uh, plans from scratch, uh, but most people prefer to edit as opposed to uh, create. So uh, we have uh, lots of uh, crowdsourced and also uh, clinically vetted plans for, for the medical elements as well. So they're all there on tap for you that, for you to modify or uh, create your own. So let's talk about the care circle. Um, so the, the care circle is really your friends and family. It can be medical personnel, it can be per, uh, access to community resources as well. It's really who you deem to be accretive to your own health. Uh, a good example of that is just uh, starting starting your um, oops, I'm sorry, starting starting your day out uh, with a greeting from somebody uh, in your family or otherwise. Uh, you don't have to use this an alarm clock, uh, but if you do, 
we're always trying to help a person emote, to talk to somebody, to you know, begin to really vocalize how they're feeling right then. So every time we have an opportunity, we, we like to ask you how you're doing. We always like to offer the opportunity for you to connect to somebody in your circle of care. And on that uh, context, everything is, you know, on our version of speed dial, it's just a picture and one touch to connect you to those people that you trust uh, the most. You don't have to know how to use a smartphone. You certainly can do this from a smartphone if you'd like to. This doesn't necessarily have to replace your smartphone should you have one. Uh, but you have one touch access to everybody who's uh, close to you. You can have a voice conversation, a video conversation, or you can just text with them. You don't need to know how to do uh, text. Uh, so we obscure all the details about how to do text and just allow you to click on the person and indicate how do I want to uh, communicate with them right now. You can also leave them a voicemail or you know, clearly a, a text message. Uh, we do have one touch emergency response and you define uh, what an emergency is and you define who to contact an emergency. This doesn't always have to be direct access to 911. Uh, a lot of times, you know, the, the lifelines are, or the personal emergency response systems don't uh, fail to kind of really meet the end goal. The person may not be in medical distress, but they are distressed. A lot of times people don't hit those medical distress buttons because they don't want to be a bother. Or they don't want people coming and breaking down the door to come in. Uh, and so a lot of times people, you know, cage up inside, reaching out to somebody, talking about something that's bothering them right now because they only have the, hey, I can't reach somebody or I have to dial 911. Uh, so there's lots of details about how you can define an emergency and who we contact. Of course, we can contact 911 on your behalf. Um, the care circle, when hit an emergency context, goes off and seeks out those individuals uh, who can be of assistance. So we may contact multiple individuals simultaneously. Um, and as people join in, we let the other people know that somebody else is there. They may still choose to join in on the call or they may choose to go, oh, my, my brother's uh, on the call with my mom. Everything's fine. I don't need to jump in right now. Uh, we're there to help you with, uh, you know, medically um, significant um, sorts of activities. If you have an appointment, whether that's a physical in-office appointment or a telehealth appointment, we're always there to help you prepare for that, give you lots of advance notice of that. And we're also letting other people in your care circle know that you do have this appointment coming up so they can be there to help uh, verify that you're going to make it on time or be of, of assistance as necessary. Hi, Mom. It's Jill with a little video message for you. I thought I'd let you know why all these wonderful assistants are there to help you. Uh, you broke your hip and you're recovering. And I know you like to have your space and, and not want someone around all the time. But it's important that you have these people here to assist you with what. Just, just an example of somebody using our video messaging. Uh, in many cases, people will turn away uh, in-home help because they kind of forget uh, that they're coming or they forget that they actually have in-home resources. So in this particular case, a uh, daughter has recorded a message that we automatically present just prior to in-home services coming just to get, get her mentally prepared that somebody is coming, who they are, as opposed to uh, them not being allowed in the door and uh, you know multiple phone calls uh, uh, coming and going as necessary. Uh, physical therapy, you know, for individuals that are either having live PT sessions or their physical therapist has provided them with a, a library of exercises to do. We'll help them to remember to do that. We can have video libraries to remind them of that. We can also record uh, those sessions for offline review by their physical therapist or others about, hey, the form looked really good, or I'm glad to see that you were um, able to, you know, complete your sit-stand exercises for the day. Lots and lots of data, as, as you can imagine. Uh, again, this is all HIPAA compliant. You only share this with who you choose to share it with, if anybody. It could just be for yourself, or it could just be for a specific family member. Uh, but all of those interactions you've had with the system, from getting up to listening, watching uh, you know, your favorite John Wayne movie, 
to uh, uh, listening or reading the news, to listening to some music, to positively or missing a, a medicine re a reminder, uh, us seeing you step on the scale, you taking your blood pressure. So all of these things come into a dashboard uh, that can be reviewed. And if you think about it, we are having tens of check-ins a day. Every time the person interacts with the tablet device is, is a check-in. You don't have to say, send a message going, hey, mom, are you okay? Are you up and moving? You already know the answer to all those questions. So you're literally getting tens of check-ins all day and all night, including if you really want to be looking for something that might happen during the night, those can be sent to you as kind of emergency notifications. Lots of vital uh, data it doesn't have to all be there, but if you you know if you have a wearable, we know blood oxygen saturation while you're sleeping. Obviously, we know your physical activity, heart rate, things of that nature. The more sophisticated the wearable, the more detailed the data that's there. Um, lots of people are fond of using our interconnected uh, weight scales. Uh, weight scales not necessarily always from a weight management standpoint, but there's uh, many uh, you know uh, cardiac conditions in that where rapid onset of uh, weight gain could be an indicator of uh, of a dangerous situation. We also um, you can create your own forms. We also have lots of forms that are around medical health checks, uh, loneliness detection. Uh, we do lots of interesting things for uh, financial security, fraud awareness, uh, and these can be presented to the individual and you can see that they have actually received it, that they've actually successfully completed the questionnaires. And if we detected any of the responses to that questionnaire, that would require somebody's uh, immediate attention or something to go take a look at. So again, it's not just digital data, it's uh, behavioral data, it's eliciting uh, uh, responses from the individual throughout the day. Uh, sleep activity, uh, step activity, uh, the correlation of sleep and steps can also indicate uh, things, uh, challenges that might be happening during the night, uh, you know, frequent bathroom visits uh, and, and similar. We end up finding a lot of undetected or undiagnosed uh, sleep apnea, which is one of the nice reasons to use the wearable device to measure uh, blood oxygen saturation during sleep cycles. And we can also see correlations between those. This is not a clinical sleep study, but we do uh, end up having lots of people referred for that because they've had conditions they were totally uh, unaware of uh, that we were able to help them detect and then take the next right steps going forward. Uh, Social activity that's happening uh, throughout the throughout the day as well. Has anybody called you? Have you called anybody? Have you texted with anybody? Again, the text here is just you talking into our tablet. It'll automatically create the text, send the text to the person. You, uh, you don't have to understand how to how to do that off your smartphone if you uh, prefer not to. So I've uh, lots more to share, but I think I'll just take a break in at right now and uh, solicit any questions that there might be from from the audience uh, before we continue on. Bob, over to you. So, so Pat, I uh, the question I guess is about the, how does the research project work with. You know, what you've outlined here, and um, I mean, you you are you are collecting and displaying and connecting so much data and information to families, caregivers, um, you know, the person themselves who's using this. Um, so, what does it take to get enrolled in this research project at at DU's uh, Noble Institute for Healthy Aging? Uh, yes. So what I had uh, posted, and ideally everybody still has it in the chat, there's the uh, email uh, for contacting uh, the research team, as well as the phone number if you just want to chat, chat to them and ask some more details about that. So to participate, you just apply and you apply by um, sending an email and or making a phone call. And now let's talk about what the research itself uh, is focused on. So the research is focused on kind of two sides of this. There's the individual, the, you know, ostensibly the aging adult. Uh, um, having said that, uh, what I've shared with you is used by 
uh, individuals in a uh, post discharge uh, recovery uh, scenario. They may have lots of the similar challenges. They just don't have a tick in the I'm, I'm older uh, box. We have lots of parents of children who are autistic or have uh, um, ADHD uh, issues. We have uh, young adults uh, with Down syndrome uh, wanting to uh, continue to you know live as independently as they possibly can. Lots of people with traumatic brain injuries. We have long haul truckers um, uh, that are diabetic or pre-diabetic using everything that I shared with you to help better manage uh, their condition or to forestall the onset of that condition in the case that they're uh, pre-diabetic and it's more lifestyle uh, than uh, genetic um, onsets. But uh, we are very focused on uh, the aging adult here at DU, and they're very focused on two sides of that. There's the aging adult themselves, so they're asking questions and, and looking at data in the context of, does is are you feeling challenged by the technology? You know, how is this easy to interact? Do you find it to be a daily part of your routine? So they're seeing how it affects their behavior and their um, sense of improvement in their overall uh, lifestyle and ability to care for themselves. And on the other side, on the caregiver side, it's are we reducing caregiver burden? Are we helping to automate tasks that you either you know, are having to do repeatedly or you're unable to do because you don't have the time to, to do those? Um, are we relieving burden because you are much better informed about what's really going on uh, at home, what's really going on with that, uh, that person? Are you relieved? Have we taken a load of guilt uh, off of your shoulders? That's another form of care, caregiver burden. So time, uh, guilt, and, and feeling of adequacy. Do you feel like you actually are able to care for this person more deeply and more in, intently because you've got an extra set of eyes and uh, ears? There's lots of layers of detail there, but at the macro level is, are you living a better life? Are you able to help a person lead a better life uh, with better efficacy and less burden on you or kind of the broad brush um, questions? So is a part of this research project then uh, getting the tablet device, um, do they have to have their own or how, how does that work? So the research participants uh, don't need anything. Uh, at the beginning of the research, there's a discussion about, hey, what are your challenges um, at home? What can we help with? Uh, there may be a long list of things you want to help and we you know, prioritize those. For, you know, what's the most important thing is sleep uh, and an issue is medicine regime. Um, uh, compliance, uh, a bigger challenge is uh, social isolation, a bigger challenge. So we rack and stack those and then agree on a calendar for beginning to tick those off. You know, with success, we move on to the next uh, challenge that you shared with us. So it starts with an assessment. The assessment then um, leads to what equipment are we going to send? So there'll be one or more tablets. A lot of times there are multiple tablets in the home, one, one at the bedside uh, because there's a great need for assistance, uh, you know, at, at bedtime, during the night, and early in the morning, and then there'll be another one in the main living area, which might be next to the, the big chair, uh, might be in the kitchen area, uh, because that's where you uh, spend the most time throughout the day. If we're helping uh, monitor uh, specific medical conditions, there might be blood pressure cuffs and other devices, weight scale. So all those things are included based on the needs of, of, the, of the individual. Some of those items the individual already has at home because it's a prescribed device. So a glucometer is a classic example of that. We're not going to replace the glucometer that you're aware of, but we will most likely digitally connect to it to help you monitor and manage it uh, better. And on that topic, uh, what we really like to do is help people if they're already not using a continuous glucose monitor. We have a partnership with Dexcom. We have had stunningly good results with people moving from the traditional uh, prick type uh, uh, litmus test uh, uh, glucometers to a continuous glucose uh, monitoring situation, you know, sterling results in helping people better manage diet, physical activity, and 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 otherwise. Uh, but if it's a, a prescribed device, uh, we don't provide that. It actually needs to come from your primary care uh, provider. So net net, um, you don't need to bring anything else. All the training. Uh, is provided. And also 
uh, we're there. We have a staff of clinicians that can be your backbench so we can help you put together the plan, help you understand how to monitor the plan. And with, uh, with your um, consent, if you say, hey, we'd like to have some of your clinicians periodically look in and just make sure that you know we're doing things the right way, that can happen as well. And, and how long would a research participant need to be in the research project? Research project is six months in duration. And I just shared an awful lot going on, but the, the research really only interrupts you th at three points in time. So they, they must establish a baseline. So there'll be a survey process that you'll go through at the beginning, at the mid, and then at the end of the six month uh, period of time. At the end of the research study, all equipment uh, that you're provided is yours is yours to keep. You're fine to keep, you know, the app, the application is yours essentially in perpetuity. So everything that you received, if you found it of value and it's helpful in uh, managing your life, uh, you're free to keep all of that and continue uh, using it. There's no ongoing, you know, no future charges or anything from Routinify or anybody in that regard. That's our gift to you for taking the time to participate in the research. How, how many people are you looking for to be research participants? Uh, the ideal number would be 60, six zero. Okay. Now, if we become over uh, subscribed, uh, we have mechanisms uh, for, for dealing with that. Uh, but 60 is the core uh, statistically significant number that we're initially wanting to start with. Now, some people in the audience, uh, some may be just looking for a, an individual, um, a family member, as an example. There may be those in the audience that are actually in the business. That is, they are providing in-home care services either because they have an agency or they might be uh, providing the in-home care services through a PASCO or other family reimbursement type of model. And they have multiple individuals that they would like to enroll, and that is fine. Uh, we actually have some uh, early participants who are in that category, and they have uh, a half dozen or more of their clients um, part of uh, the uh, study. So it can be one or it can be more than one. Uh, the only rule of engagement, if it's more than one, is we just want to you know, really understand the, the business that you're in and, and make sure that um, you're in a position to actually properly you know, monitor and manage and assist uh, multiple individuals. Okay. Okay, uh, does anyone else have any questions for, for Pat about this project? Don't be bashful. Okay. <laughs> um, well, I'm, I'm not hearing any at the moment, but I, I think you explained it very well, Pat. And I really appreciate the background into what, you know how this all works and who connects to what and um, and in fact, that people can say, well, I, you know, I don't want somebody to know, you know, how much I weigh, for example, but, you know, you, whatever it is. Um, and then um, so it, it's an opportunity for people to test this out and uh, see how it's working for them and uh, give you give you the data that you need to uh, in, include more people going forward in, in what you're doing. So we I really appreciate that. And. I don't, do you have any other comments, Pat? Before we before we go, I, I, I do. And and usually, uh, you know, what comes out of the audience is um, a lot of people. Oh, you know, maybe the next generation. You know, seniors don't grok tech; they don't understand tech. And it's just it's 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 not true. Uh, and we've proven that in multiple cases. The challenge with technology and aging adults is uh, well, there's two primary components. The first is we give them tech that was actually intended for teens and tweens and you know it wasn't it wasn't designed or intended for that audience so the user interface is all wrong it's it's not delivering the value that that person is looking for it has boatloads of extraneous stuff so design is important just like in a house architecture is important you really need to know what it is you're going to do with it before you build it, and then you use that as essentially your site your site plan. So we've been fortunate uh, to work with uh, teams of gerontologists. We've gone through multiple rounds of research, 
uh, with individuals who really understand uh, individuals with cognitive challenges and, and that. So our experience is it's not the aging adult that has any challenge with it. We find them to interact with it, particularly if you add value to their life. Instead of just taking data away from it, you feed it back. You know, you'll be surprised how many people want to close their own rings. We don't use the ring metaphor, but people really do get vested in how well they're sleeping and their physical activity and and uh, their overall routines and things of that nature. So we find the uh, aging adults to be highly engaged and that the technology is not an issue. The other problem with technology is you show up with an iPad and then it goes dead and it ends up in a drawer or whatever. Our device is prominently displayed all the time. It's It operates as a clock. So it's, it's always there. You're always looking at it. It's not like I only look at it once a week or twice a week. You're constantly interacting with it. It's playing music to you. You're seeing family photos. You're talking to it. You're interacting with it. And so it's a part of your daily life. And that's the other issue with tech is it's just used episodically. It's the wrong design. It's the wrong application. It's very hard to find the application that you really want. And you rarely use it. So there's no familiarity. Uh, we make sure it's you know plugged in and turned on because it is a safety device. So we want to make sure it's there seven days a week, 24 hours a day. If we detect issues with it, we make sure that other people know well in advance. So you don't have to show up and find out that it's in the sock drawer somewhere and been there for, for weeks. Same thing with the wearables. We help people remember to take them off when they're charged up. We help them remember to put them back on. If they're su unsuccessful doing it themselves, you can televisit with the person or the next time you're in your home, help them be successful. So long, long answer to it's not a challenge for the aging adults, uh, wearable and otherwise. It's the right technology developed the right way with the right user interface with a consistent inter mode of interaction. Where there is a challenge is on the other side. It's on the caregiver side. So, and that can be family members. You know, family members come in and they get so enamored with the tech and, you know, they confuse people and then they split and then they're not, they don't stick with it. They don't reinforce your use of it. Um, they only reinforced it when they came over at Easter or Mother's Day or something like that. And we make sure that you're there reinforcing these interactions on a daily or, or multiple times during the week. On the commercial basis, the objections are even a little bit harder to deal with. We have had challenges with in-home care services uh, where they um, you know, kind of bristle at two things. And I hope I'm not... Um, uh, causing any ripples here. One is, oh, wait, wait a minute. You're managing us because you're making sure we really did show up on time and you're making sure that we really did do things and you're really seeing how well that person was before our visit and after our visit. And you're asking us to have our caregivers interact directly with the family members. And we usually don't want that interaction. We want family members only talk to the management. And, you know, we have, we're very fond of people taking videos while they're there talking about how the person's doing and, and interacting. So that sometimes goes against the grain for a lot of in-home uh, providers. Um, and in, when we're deployed in a uh, managed facility uh, or a congregate living type of area, uh, similar concerns uh, come into play. Uh, the other one is, hey, you're making people aware of a lot of data. And if we're aware of that data, the expectation might be that we should be doing something about it. Um, I don't want to get into people's business models, but you know, if, if a person under your care is in distress, you you really should know about it, whether whether you think you're going to be in a legally liable situation is a different different question. I don't believe that is the case. But so uh, tech adoption is actually on the other side. And it's not the tech itself, it's what the tech means. It's like, oh, we've been automating things that you are charging a minimum of three hours in home for. We're gathering data that you might feel that you need to be aware of and act upon. So it's really the change in the workflow, it's the change in the expectations has been a bigger go-to-market challenge for us than aging adults um, adopting the tech. Very good. I'll get off my soapbox now and we'll let you wrap things up. Thank you for that, though. <laughs> One other question. Uh, you used the word grok a few minutes ago. Not everyone knows what that means. Oh, yeah. So, so I'm talking I'm, I'm talking about uh, <laughs> the wrong tech for the wrong demographic. So grok is just to understand things. Um, okay. But but grok's, I mean, 
you know, I'm, I'm pushing 70 myself. So, you know, I, I used Grok decades ago, so it's, it's, it's old, the new world. <laughs> it's all. No, I, I, I've actually read the book, you know, that had yeah. the word rock in it. So, um, an old science fiction book, right? Yeah. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so, uh, do we have any other questions before we sign off? Okay. Right. Seeing none. Well, thanks so much, Pat, and thank thanks to the folks who joined us today. And uh, we will get this recording uh, uh, posted on our website soon. And uh, please ask some of your neighbors, friends to uh, to check it out and see if they might become interested in participating in this research project, which is being uh, hosted right here in Denver at the uh, University of Denver. Uh, so thanks again, everybody, and uh, have a great rest of your day. Take care. Bye right. right for now. Bye -bye.